Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about this little moss scene that I've got here. There's a couple things that I wanted to discuss that uh, relate to sort of world scale and uh, some tricks that I use for color that you might find interesting. So first let's talk about world scale. Uh, you can get kind of caught up in the idea when using a tool like Gaia where uh, its main function, as you may perceive it, is to of course create things like mountains, right? It's meant to make large world things, but uh, ultimately in 3D, scale is uh, a perceived element for the most part. There are some very practical things that are applied in here, uh, such as, you know, uh, th we've got scale height information, we also have uh, scale in, in nodes like erosion and if you go into 3d you have scale that talks about you know using centimeters inches and so on and so forth but when it all comes down to it it's really about context how is this item being seen and what are the details of the object if i make a shoe or a person or anything like that in maya and it's only one centimeter tall inside of maya if i show a picture of it how does the audience know how does it know how big that object is really it doesn't it bases it on what it sees that object with if I you know have a tiny little person next to a very large shoe I might think that either the shoe is really big or I might think that the person is really small again additional context will help that if I see you know the shoe next to the house and the person and it's still really large then I'm gonna assume that the scale of the shoe is the thing that's off so a lot of scale is perceived and it's about context in this particular case, I'm making something that is really um, close up, something that, you know, I'm standing in front of a field of moss. Uh, you've seen in my other videos, I've done things like, you know, a cliffside with a beach. And then of course I've done things like actual full on islands from a distance. So don't allow yourself to get caught up in the idea that everything has to be massive. Uh, you, know, that you have to deal with only one scale or they have to change all these settings throughout the software in order to make it, you know, do smaller stuff. It's all about how you use the tools. So um, moving through this here, I'm gonna start at the beginning. Just right click and I'm going to pin this for color so that this is what it uses for color for the next little bit. So what I wanted to start off with was noise. I did try a bunch of different things. I tried you know, starting off with Perlin, Voronoi, and some other things to get uh, sort of clump shapes. And those are nice and I use a little bit of that uh, throughout the, the process. But ultimately, um, I wanted two things. Number one, I wanted pretty defined clumps. These, uh, these little uh, round shapes that I see in areas around me. There's, there's lots of different uh, types of moss. I'm here in British Columbia and we've got all that stuff all over the place. So um, I wanted to get those, those distinctive clumps. You have some bigger mounds and then smaller clumps that kind of live together. And I also wanted to, with those clumps to get the variation in color. I didn't have a real distinctive way of um, getting that variation that I wanted. Uh, by you know scattering color through it. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna start off with the noise here, make it really tall, run it through cells, and have lots of chaos and adjust the scale to the size of the clumps. This is establishing this, the scale of my actual um, terrain, right? Because the size of these details are what's gonna define the scale of my terrain. So these are the size of my clumps. I'll take these through a uh, small blur, so 0.5, so I adjusted that. And then another larger blur, which is the defaults, which is two, and combine them together. What I have is big clumps layered in with small clumps. Again, just a default blend, 50%. We take that down just by piping it down into a constant here, right into the mask. We can start to see, see this pattern, so I'm getting sort of clumps but they don't really have defined edges yet and if you've looked at a lot of different kinds of moss you'll often see this um, effect of these you know sort of defined edges defined regions of, the, of growth so aperture provides me with that sense so if we look at that close you can see those sort of defined borders so it's just the default aperture i didn't have to change anything 
Okay, so that's a good starting point. But the other element to using these cells was actually that I ran it through a MOS texture. So the MOS texture is loaded into a synth right now, and I adjusted the number of stops, the, the fuzziness, played with the rotation, uh, all to get a nice variation in there. And because of this cells, and because of that chaos, I'm getting lots of different heights. And because they're flat, they're all gonna pull that same color value. So what it's doing in here is it's going like, I'm grabbing this slice and this slice over here and this slice there. And it's grabbing different slices and then laying them down. So I get this variation. And that's all well and good, but of course I don't have, you know, nice smooth borders that I would want. Everything's harsh. Now I can't just go ahead and blur the cells and run it through because that would change where it was picking different slices but based on height. If we take a look at this Perlin noise here, you can see it's got you know a few smooth gradients. There's a little bit of roughness here, but you know it's, it's essentially got lots of smooth gradients. And if I run that through synth, what you can see is what it'll do. It'll do these sort of you know ripples throughout here. So by taking this, I want to blur this, but I can't just plug a blur into it. Blurs want single channel information, not three channels at once. At least not for the moment. So the easy way to get around that is to just run it through an RGB split and then blur it and then copy paste that for each one of the other channels. The end result of course is now I've got those soft little clumps all scattered throughout there. I did the same idea here, splitting it off, blurring it quite a bit. I think those are probably the default. Those are probably like uh, the two, where these are probably around, you know, uh, 0.25 or 0.12 or something like that. Something really small. And I get these big areas. And then by mixing them together with min, I get this breakup. So bunch of you know blotchy bits as well as some bigger smooth regions. So let's look at this in context of the shape. I'm just going to take this, pin it for color, I'll move to that. And what you can see here is this bigger shape here happens to, just by luck, happens to be having some of that big smoother region. And then some of these patches look very much distinctly like they're following the individual patch color. So I'm getting some nice variation in there. And it's partly, partly based on the shape. Now this texture, um, I can output this as is if I wanted. I could stop right there. And I could output this uh, to do the further processing that I need to do in order to make this a final texture for use in other software. Um, you know, taking it to something like Substance, a bitmap to, to Material, and uh, outputting the height, the normal, and the color, and then allowing it to generate a seamless map for me. And this would be fine where it is because it could be seen from further away. I do, however, want a texture that I can see up closer. You'll notice that I'm in 2K here. So if I created myself a nice 2K texture, uh, with lots of detail in it, I can get a little bit closer to this than, than that. So this is where I decided to continue to detail it. To start that off, I created another Perlin noise. And then running that through a constant just so I could see what it's doing, you can see the pattern that's being generated, this additional ripple pattern. That's a nice start but I needed a lot rougher than that. So I took a displace, set scale way down and its complexity uh, is, is all the way up here. Just increase the strength a bit and uh, set it to vertical. And that really roughed it up for me. So you can see that there's still some of that other pattern still present. And so this is giving me a medium sized noise and a small sized noise in there. Running that through a bias gain just to enhance some of the details and then running it through a clamp 
And the reason why I'm using clamp, you'll see it's set to clip, nothing's being changed. The whole point of this is whenever I use a bias gain, I tend to follow up with a clamp. The reason for this is that if I ever go into values that are below the minimum or above the maximum, often cases they will be maintained. Um, you go ahead and put them into a combine and you'll see that it will combine those details that you thought were lost. This isn't a problem because sometimes you want that to happen. In this particular case and some other cases, I don't want that to happen. So if I do want to keep those you know, negative values or positive values for other purposes, um, I wouldn't use this. But in this particular case, I just use this as a cleanup feature just to make sure. So combining that back in here, I adjust for the amount that I want. And you see I've got this nice, soft, clumpy, mossy texture already. It's already looking pretty good. So if we brought that in, pin for color, compare that up with the, uh, the texture as it is right now, and you can see I'm, I'm pretty close to finished. Any additional details that I add here are just me being kind of finicky. So I did, of course, add some additional features. And um, I didn't really need to lower it, but I, I did a little bit. I could probably just go directly out of this. Like I said, finicky. Um, I ran it through soil to pick, pick out you know, the indentations, wherever the indentations were, and ran an aperture on that. And all this is doing is it's just roughing up the borders of this a little bit further. Without touching the soft details on the top of these, it's going in and it's uh, plugging away at these, uh, these edges. And it just gives it more of a torn, kind of rough feeling there, which I, I feel fits in with a mossy texture. Now before I get into the other final details that I added throughout here again, which were super finicky, not necessary, but what can I say? Um, we'll take this color here and uh, I really enhance it. I bring it way up. And the reason for that is I'm actually going to be blending it in with another copy of this other one and it's going to mute it out. So rather than losing some of this lovely breakup detail that I've got in here to this, this other copy of the color, um, I just went and uh, enhanced it. Um, was it contrast? So I, I adjusted the contrast up. Uh, I tried a few different things first, which is why I was clicking through here. I'd forgotten which one I'd use. I used the contrast. Um, that gave me, without changing the uh, values too, too much or the saturation too, too much, it kind of covered everything evenly, uh, that, that gave me what I needed. So again, constant noise, again, set to the very bottom here, and then the noise brought in onto, over top of it. Running that through synth, it's getting close, and you can see that noise pattern that was generated in this lower region. So I could have brought it up higher and I would have seen a lot more variation in color, but I was satisfied with this. So this is the, the overall co coverage. And this works fairly nicely. If we mix them together, you can see that I've gone from that same detail that's there back in without losing that, but I've added that noise, that color noise. So that's because of that contrast. And it took a little while just adjusting the two of them back and forth until I got that. Okay, final nitpicking. So I've got something nice, right? Pin for color, got that there. Pretty good, I could stop right there but I wanted to add some more ridges in here. So just some more carving in to break it up even further. There's not, a lot of this stuff is, is you know, a bit stacked on top of everything else. I just wanted something to cut in in a few different areas, a little bit randomly. So 
I want the Voronoi. I adjusted the scale all the way up to get this pattern. Did an auto level with everything on, so it brought everything as high up as possible. A blur to get rid of some of the smaller noise. And a curvature to then isolate some of those ridges. I wanted that inverted because I wanted the, uh, the, the values all the way around. And it looked like that, but I couldn't really see it. So to get a little bit more absolute, a little bit sharper, I went with the height and just tweaked the values until I got those ridges that I wanted. Now that's basically mask information. I want to convert it to height information. I could have um, done it here, but a nice easy way to, to do that, of course, is just plugging it into a constant and then you can control the height of the end result at the same time. So not only do I output it here, but I also get to control how tall it is once I produce that. Now I wanted to break it up a little bit more and also wanted to sharpen it. So the first pass of that was of course landform, which did do some sharpening uh, overall, but it definitely roughed things up. And then going to apex, which is only going to sharpen it further. And uh, at the basis here, it's just going to smooth that, that border. So taking it from this, let's look at it from the top, see that moss pattern, and subtract. And just a small amount of it, and again, it's just creating some of those little ridges in here that are just breaking up that pattern just a tiny bit more. So again, like I said, super nitpicky, but it's my prerogative. It gives a nice breakup, it gives some of those ripples that I'm accustomed to seeing, which happens from, I guess, maybe the erosion of the dirt underneath. But it's a nice pattern and I'm satisfied with it. So go to pin for color, go to here, and voila, I have my moss. So once again, I want to go ahead and output that, um, the color, the uh, the height, and the normal map to get a, a decent quality final. So part of my next step here would be doing something like uh, I could take the normal map in this particular case. I can't always use the normal map for this purpose. There's other things that you know, uh, prevent that. Often cases you want the normal map based off of from a low res to a high res. So I'm just going to adjust this. Um, the uh, the height information, uh, the distance between your height and your length is is really extreme, and I don't want it like that. So I'm just going to double that twice. Right click, double that twice. and I get something a little bit closer to um, a normal map that I expect. Uh, it's subtle it's in terms of its detail, which is all that's really necessary in this particular case. Um, if we want to see it without everything else on it, we'll just go ahead and pin this for color. So you can see that. And there's my normal map. And depending where I take it, I can always flip the Y um, for work with, I guess, probably OpenGL. But there it is, and I can output that, and I can adjust it further in, in Photoshop if I need to. So to output these things, of course, I would then output by right clicking mark for export. This one as well, mark for export. And once more, mark for export. And proceed to the build of those, giving these the appropriate names and uh, saving up my final file. So that's it for this video. Uh, hopefully you got something useful out of this. Uh, the, the particular things, of course, is how to think about scale and uh, this other
cool little color trick in order to get sort of scattered color as well as the ability to blur color channels in uh, a fairly decent way.